Hey everyone, today I'm joined again by Matt Segal. Uh, Matt's an associate professor uh, at California Institute of Integral Studies in the Department of Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness. Uh, Matt, of course, is a brilliant Whitehead scholar um, and just generally wonderful thinker, um, has a wonderful substack, and uh, engaging in the uh, the topics that are nearest and dearest to my heart, uh, but comes at these topics from a different angle. And so I'll say more about this in a second, but Matt, Matt is a wonderful interlocutor and uh, a decent, uh, wonderful human being as well. So I appreciate being able to dig more into these topics uh, with Matt. Matt just wrote a uh, response piece um, for one thing on about my my recent book, uh, this universal learning process book that's coming out as part of the series on the evolution of meaning. And so we thought it'd be cool opportunity to talk more about that and to try to unpack a bit more the different ways that we are conceiving of some of these um, big big issues that we're both passionate about. So uh, thank you again, Matt, for coming on the podcast. And I look forward to uh, digging into this again with you. Yeah, Brandon, been looking forward to this and uh, really enjoyed reading your book. Um, just, I learned so much, you know, and especially around thermodynamics, I, I went, I did a reasonably deep dive, you know, maybe like 10 years ago when I was in grad school. And it's amazing to see how, much further the ball has moved forward just in that time. And so it's mm. great for you. You kind of got, got me caught up to speed there. And uh, so, yeah, let's, let's dig into it. Cool. Um, yeah. And I mean, gosh, that topic alone, there's so much um, uh, there and I, I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there, there's, there's so much here in general. So one of the things, um, well, before actually, before I say anything else, I did want to double down on this notion that I just, of the mutual, uh, respect that I think we both have for each other, but just for my part, how much I really um, appreciate you as an interlocutor, as someone who, uh, when I think about, um, as recently, you came to mind as an example, as someone who, you know, we both care a lot about these issues. We have rather different takes on some very fundamental aspects of it, but just the way that you show up to these conversations is always very charitable, respectful. Uh, there's just a decency and a goodness. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate that. And, and so, um, yeah, I love being able to have these deep conversations where there are maybe some profound metaphysical, philosophical worldview, theological disagreements, but, um, but it's great when those are generative tensions and productive and fruitful and fun and uh, good spirited. And so I, I appreciate you very much for that. Um, so yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, but, um, so yeah, the other thing I wanted to do, uh, briefly because it's such a big topic, um, all this stuff that we're trying to, to get at. And so, um, uh, the thought occurred to me that, you know, like trying to find a way into some of this so that it's not just this sprawling thing in this hydra that one issue comes up in another thing is that, you know, we could try to offer some kind of uh, summary um, maybe of where we think each other is coming from um, or of our own positions relative to what this thing is that we're trying to, to talk about what we're trying to uncover. Um, so that I thought could be, you know, one way into this and uh, just, you know, to take a couple of minutes to try to do that and then maybe dive into some of the, the, the finer details. How does that sound to you? Great idea. Cool. Yeah. Um, and so I, let me, let me tr make an attempt at that then uh, through this term that uh, that you threw out in this piece uh, of uh, pan Matthewism, which uh, is this a coinage? You said, let's christen this topic, this, but I, I, I when I Googled it, I've I been throwing it. pan on so many different words uh, <laughs> with different interlocutors to try to arrive at some agreement. Uh -huh. I haven't heard it before. Maybe someone's used it, but I just, yeah, yeah came up with it. I, yeah, I loved it so much for many kind of reasons. Um, so, so, what that term means is uh, pan meaning all and and uh, math means comes from the Greek mathane meaning to learn. Um, and so a notion of sort of reality as pan mathistic means sort of like this all learning uh, nature of reality. But I also love the the kind of connotative or associative aspect because it has that sound of theism in there as well, pan mathism. Uh, so to kind of a, a kind of uh, you know, take on panentheism or pantheism, panmathism, uh, is a great term for this, you know, worldview or, or frame of reality that I'm trying to present in this book, which is that the universe represents a, a universal learning process and that there's this unfolding uh, nature of reality that uh, uh, occurs as a kind of learning process. And, um, and so that I think is, is something that uh, we're both, uh, you know, speaking to, I think in, in your, 
uh, response, you said at one point that uh, that there's a lot of convergence on that, and that uh, as you said, uh, stand in complete alignment with this overall argument that learning is the archetypal act of transcendence. Um, and so, I, just as sort of a starting point, we're interested in that topic, and so um, that would be where I might begin with some of this. And uh, and I don't know how does that you know are, are, how how does that starting place work for you? Well. Learning is super important, and I think part of my um, attitude in entering into got conversations like this is uh, a kind of pedagogical attitude. I, I know I have something to learn. I love to learn. I know you love to learn. And so how better to get actually get meta in the sense of uh, a kind of second order cybernetics approach to be what we are trying to describe the universe as doing, to do what we're trying to describe the universe as being. Um, and so that is a, a rather large place uh, to converge, I think. And so uh -huh. panmathism um, could be a banner that uh, unites many of us who disagree on, on the, the fundamentals um, because we're trying to continue to broaden our own perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, and... And so, yeah, I mean, should I should I share a bit of what I think, where I think you're coming from? And yeah, and yeah, go for I'm... it. That'd be great. So it seems to me that, um, you know, in framing your project as meta modern, that this this sort of um, dating of a uh, a, a true um, historical break is 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 quite important in the sense that there was a moment in recent human history when we began to see the world in a fundamentally new way uh and it led to a break from certain kinds of mythic and magical uh and uh religious modes of of uh understanding um and engagement with with reality to a fundamentally scientific mode where um we don't pretend to have a priori access to uh, uh, a, a rational being who is in charge of the world, but rather recognize ourselves to be at least somewhat rational, and we hope to become more rational and capable of studying a natural world that um, may not have been created by a rational being, but that nonetheless is intelligible to us. And that this break is so important that you know we really need to distance ourselves from uh, what say, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking mostly in a, a sort of Western European, um, context here, but it might apply across culturally, but the, you know, the Bible was basically, uh, the document from which all truth and goodness and beauty w w was meant to come for, um, uh, for people. And we, and that there's, there's a, there's just a real important, um, new methodology new way of understanding ourselves and understanding nature uh that that requires um yeah rejecting these mythic and magic ways of knowing however you also acknowledge that this new modern scientific way of understanding the world uh was too reductionistic and it doesn't do justice to um our own um uh, human conscious capacities it doesn't seem to do justice to the forms of order and organization and complexity that nature is capable of as itself an evolutionary uh learning process and so the meta move is is going beyond just this initial modern break with uh tradition let's say to to try to acknowledge um that which cannot be reduced to um some kind of mechanistic process cannot be reduced to uh, just rules governing uh, the interaction of parts, but there is some kind of a, a holistic emergent um, intelligence. And even that it could be that the universe, while it didn't begin in an act of divine creation, may give rise to something like a God uh, through our own collective um, agency, uh, the, the interactive uh the interaction between um, human beings as we learn together could give rise to something approaching a kind of divine intelligence. Um, and so you're, you're trying to rediscover uh, maybe what was lost by this sharp break that modernity represents with the traditional ideas of the past 
uh, but recover them in a way that would be um, compatible with everything we know scientifically. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that's at least the rough edges of of where you're uh, where you come down uh, on you know what we ought to be struggling with in our moment uh, in time to become meta modern and not succumb to any pre modern temptations. Yeah, that's interesting to to. I, I always forget how interesting an exercise this is in general. Just to uh, you know hear the reflections on you know. Uh, what what we are putting out, what we're presenting, and how that's landing for people, and the and the most salient points is kind of an interesting thing, uh, as well. So um, that also helps me helps me think about you know yeah because I think the rough edges sure, and then it's interesting to kind of maybe begin to finesse like uh, those particular emphases in terms of like oh that's interesting that that lands as a as a particular emphasis or something that could be um, you know worked out. So that's that's really helpful, and then I can try to, you know, reflect back to you what I'm interpreting, you know, where you're coming at it, which again, I think there's a lot of shared um, recognition starting from the notion that uh, there is dynamic creativity sort of at the heart of the universe. Um, of course, being a, uh, you know, sort of white heady and acolyte uh, or, or someone who, uh, who finds a lot of uh, insight uh, in the, in the kind of process relational framing and in Whitehead's thought in particular, uh, there is this notion that um, basically one, and I think this is something that continues to be a source of, uh, of, of divergence between the particular ways then that we wind up fleshing out a kind of similar project is that there's a pan psychic component to, or as it might tend to be called or pan experientialist component that as you trace down and sort of into the fabric of reality, uh, you don't necessarily ever lose touch with what we would think of as the internal or the, uh, or the experiential or the feeling side of things. Um, but that that goes all the way down and that there's therefore this lifelike aspect to all levels of, of, uh, of the universe and that, um, any, dependence upon maybe strictly mechanistic uh, or stochastic framings of reality are ultimately going to be falling short of something which it's to the degree that they miss that kind of inherently dynamic creative and to some extent therefore kind of like willful or intentional aspect to every m moment in the kind of co uh, cosmic unfolding um, and so, you know, that deepens across time, but I think one of the things you're trying to emphasize in this piece is that metaphysically, there's no like rupture there that if you go all the way down, there's still this stuff of like what we can identify as down at the bottom in a sense. And that, uh, therefore we're justified in kind of, uh, a unique application of our own epistemological and phenomenological lenses on reality, trying to make sense of the world through that because it has deep continuity, fundamental continuity with the uh, ontological nature of reality. And then finally, because of that, um, a kind of critique that, 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 that arises from that appreciation of certain forms of modern scientific um, abstraction model creation and what you know Whitehead calls this uh, fallacy of misplaced concreteness of, of creating these models about reality that we that, that we then sort of mistake for reality um, and so getting therefore kind of disconnected with uh, the real nature of things because we've invented this sort of like uh, mechanical uh, sort of you know uh, toy of how things work conceptually but then we um, we kind of forget that that's just a tool uh, so there's a there's a, a number of kind of epistemological and ontological metaphysical critiques in there um, as they are sort of themselves all situated as part of a similar project to try to move beyond sort of modern reductionism, reductionism and the kind of nihilism and relativism into a kind of, uh, you know, revitalized understanding of the grand reality, the kind of grand narrative of existence, which is uh, ultimately something that we are very at home in. How does that land for you? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's that's about it. I think the only the only little tweak I would make is that one of the one of the points I'm trying to get across is that you know with the pan experientialism thing, you yeah it's accurate to to, to describe it at least to begin with as saying that some kind of mind or or feeling goes all the way down, but we have this way of thinking top down, big small. Uh, and I, I think that the process relational kind of ontology is is an invitation to shift out of that way of even um, 
mapping reality mm -hmm. in terms of um when you go down and you get to the littler things and you go up and you get to the bigger things instead of thinking of small and big thinking more in terms of um whole and, and part and that also all of the parts contain the whole in some sense hmm. already and so pan psychism pan experientialism is not just like oh the all even the itty litty the itty little biddle the itty i can't say this word it's itty bitty bitsy little things yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh down at the bottom are experiential in some sense but it's also to say that the whole thing the whole the world soul is also an important level of um not just analysis, I guess, but synthesis to consider. Uh, and so, you know, where does wholeness come from in the first place? If you get it at the level of a hydrogen atom, there's a kind of wholeness that's realized. You get it at the level of a a, a cell. Uh, you get it at the level of of an animal body. There's some kind of wholeness that's manifesting at the level of a of Gaia, like a living planet. Where does that Where does that come from? I think there's there's got to be some kind of arche type for that. And so. Mm -hmm. Pan experientialism, or I'm happy to say panpsychism too, as long as we acknowledge there are different species of it. Mm -hmm. There's a substance form of panpsychism that's popular among analytic philosophers that I think is um, not that helpful, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but the process form of panpsychism is saying, yeah, there is a world soul, which is to say that there is a wholeness manifest at the level of the cosmos, and that that wholeness is in some sense alive and living, not in the same way that a cell is alive, but in some sense, the cell is a recapitulation of that cosmic life. Mm -hmm. um, and so this this kind of whole part way of thinking and never forgetting that the parts are holographically recapitulating the whole um, is also part of what a panpsychic mm. metaphysics in the process relational sense would mean for me, right? So yeah. Okay. Getting away from the small, big ways of thinking about the universe, which to me, I mean, Plato was already hip to this. It's kind of like, those are relative terms. How, how are we really getting to the metaphysical core of anything by thinking about the universe in terms of big and small? I'm not sure. Hmm. Like metaphysics is a search for scale-free categories would be another way of putting it. Yeah. Well, that's a good lead up into what one aspect of this conversation I thought we could get into because, and I also, I'll say, you know, audience you know, bear with us in the sense of uh, being patient, because I feel like um, one of the things that's exciting about this conversation that we're having and that other folks are having, too, um, is that there's a lot going on here. And and for like a conversation like this, um, I think it's worth taking our time to sort of unpack things and kind of sift through them, um, especially because, one, these are systematic sort of framings. These are our holistic kinds of framings of reality. So if you pull on one thread, it kind of moves this thing over here. And, you know, there, there's a kind of gestalt element to this. So um, so that's important. But also, uh, you know, we're, we are... <clears throat> I think in many ways aligned in many in, in respects on the gestalt. It's it's the fine details uh, uh, of really digging into like where where is the divergence here and and what are the repercussions of that, and that actually takes some um, some you know uh, detail work to get into, and that then takes some time to you know just unpack. <laughs> a lot in order to be able to get to that level of granularity that we get some clarity about things. So, um, so I, I, I conceive of our conversations as one being part of like a broader conversation, both in the sense that other people are having aspects of this conversation too, but also that we're, this is sort of an ongoing conversation that you and I are engaged in. And, uh, you know, whether that takes the explicit form of like an actual, um, you know, sort of like series of conversations, the way that some folks do, like Greg and John or whoever. Um, you know, it, it it it's in that vein. So there's a kind of slow motion um, element to this. Um, okay, so but I did. Let's start there on this notion of um, of metaphysics. So on this n notion of metaphysical scale free categories, um, I wanted to pose this to you because at one point you kind of raised this in the uh, the response piece uh, that that you. That you wrote um so you say quote whatever the metaphysical categories we construct end up being they should apply everywhere to every entity regardless of scale and complexity and uh and that was that sort of stood out to me as being like oh okay this might be a point where we could kind of um begin to illuminate some of the differences of how we're coming at this issue because uh one of the thoughts i would propose to you that i think is a good way of describing the way i look at this is that I actually would 
propose that metaphysical categories themselves emerge or evolve. Um, and what I mean by that uh, is, I guess, something like the way, you know, that 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 Greg talks about it in a you talk framing that you're going to need a, a different kind of metaphysical set of of ways of thinking about, let's say, human culture uh, than what you're what you would uh, apply to, say, physical atoms. Um, and because these are genuinely emergent sort of ontic planes of existence that come into being, uh, that you can't just sort of take categories from other parts of complexity and apply them equally to others. Now, this might then lead us to the kind of ridiculous notion of meta metaphysical categories, right? Like what are the kind of laws or logic or reason or deep structures that would then sort of be able to include uh, and account for all of these different kinds of categories. But I, as a first pass, how does that idea land to you if you hear the notion that um, uh, that metaphysical categories emerge and are, are themselves part of the creative process? Uh, and two, just that to help frame that as a meaningful way that maybe we're differently approaching this big topic and how we think about these things and, and therefore accounting for some of the different conclusions we draw. Well, you're absolutely right. I, I completely agree that we need to somehow account for the possibility of new categories arising. Um, and, you know, Whitehead actually has, uh, he has these eight major categories in his metaphysical scheme. And, it's kind of absurd. It, it, he's got like 28 categories of explanation. And the first part of process and reality just scares a lot of people away for this reason. It's like, whoa, this is Baroque. Like, where are you mm. coming up with all this stuff? But he fully intends it to be an open-ended scheme and that mm. we're going to continue to need to add things as our experience deepens because he ultimately wants experience to be the criterion of our metaphysics. But he actually has, you know, so you, you get the actual entities, the eternal objects, uh, the prehensions, the what he calls propositions. These are his categories, right? But he has an eighth category that he calls contrasts, um, which is the ways that prehensions come together to form patterns. And he says that this eighth category actually includes in its nature a kind of indefinite progression of mm. new categories mm. because we can proceed from contrasts to contrasts of contrasts and so on to indefinitely higher grades of contrasts. And so yeah, built into the scheme is this possibility of new categories. Um, but a contrast is is a less um, earth uh, uh, shattering category than a, um, there's novelty there, there's genuine novelty there as new contrasts arise, but it's not as fundamental as an actual entity or an eternal object. An actual entity you could also uh, call an occasional subject, because then you get better at the contrast with eternal objects, you have occasional subjects and eternal objects. Those are really, um, you know, the, the two categories that White is saying apply at all. And so when you say that what reality is finally made of are these event-like um, entities, not, a, not like, they are events, um, for him that means that, yeah, there's a mental phase, a mental pull to that just as much as there's a physical phase or a physical pull, uh, which for him in other words, means that there's a kind of uh, repetition of the past. Every event includes a repetition of the past and some degree of anticipation of the future, right? And so for him, you, you're not going to be able to remain concrete in your descriptions of, of reality at whatever scale unless you've got all of this going on, right? And so if you think that nature is made of some kind of instantaneously present bit of matter, that's the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. There is no such thing in nature. That's an but, idea, it turns yeah. out. But see, but th that, as I hear that, lands for me is just the opposite way. Because like, I want to say that metaphysical categories are abstractions um, that we that we generate from real actual entities and, and processes in reality to then try to account for how those occur. Um, for example, when I if I were to be doing straight up metaphysics, I guess I'd probably land somewhere myself in like a dialectics of uh, like a metaphysical dialectics. I do think that when you look at there being, you know, a, well, I don't know, there's some sense of like plurality and then sort of uh, a, the way that uh, a plurality creates a kind of relationship. And then that relationship e exists ultimately then within a higher totality that's able to take those plural entities in the relational aspect as part of, as like subsystems within a higher system. 
that is a process that I see going on in all aspects of the universe. And you could even account that relate that very directly to the learning process. You can relate that to evolution. You can do all these things. So sounds like could, a great account of concrescence as well. Just the plurality, relationality, totality. It's another okay. way of describing concrescence. It's, but it's so, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting though, because there's a the way that I tend to associate that is like, okay, that's a good model for trying to account for how things occur. But I wouldn't say then like let's just stick stick with some very kind of um, you know, Hegelian language, which actually isn't even Hegel, but like a thesis into this is uh, synthesis, which, you know, in the Hegelian tradition sometimes gets used. And I know that wasn't Hegel, but um, I don't think that antithesis and synthesis and thesis are like real metaphysical entities. I feel like they are real ways. How would you say they are terms we might use to account for real processes that have a pattern nature that we can see occurring in reality. But if you're looking for what is the most real aspect of something going on there, uh, I wouldn't place that in the metaphysical or in the metaphysical dialectics category. I would place that in what's actually happening, right? Is something learning like, like when I learn, you know, and I'm taking two mental constructs and I'm putting them together to create a higher totality and a recursive complexification process, um, it's the actual instantiated embodied fact of that occurring that is real. And then the dialectics is just this abstract model that I use to make sense of it. So I would say that trying to do metaphysics, you know, properly requires that we own that we're abstracting that these things, we don't want to make this platonic move and say, oh, these are actually more real or most real. Do you know what I mean? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, or is that how you think of it? Is that how Whitehead thinks of it? Or... Yeah, well, I guess it's paradoxical, right? Because obviously, like his account of the concrescence of actual occasions is a, a kind of abstraction, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's not trying to say reality is made of these abstractions, um, but he's he's trying to account for the nature of concrete reality in such a way that we see how abstraction is a real part of its how it functions, mm -hmm. uh, and that the, this capacity to abstract isn't introduced by language using human beings. It's actually part of how physical process operates uh, already, uh, that there's a coarse graining activity, that there's a kind of um, a process of filtering and prehensive unification in his terms that's very dialectical as you're describing. Actually, Whitehead's account of the learning process in the most general sense that he could manage to describe it is that's what concrescence is an attempt to do. And it is this movement from as you described it, I think plurality to relationality to totality. Mm -hmm. uh, Concrescence begins with the physical prehension of objective data in the past, which is a plurality, a multiplicity, you could say. Mm -hmm. And that grows together into those, that objective data grows together into a new subject, experiencing itself mm -hmm. uh, from a novel perspective that's never existed before, realizing some novel value, subjectively, immediately experiencing that, but then perishing to become a superject which is then new subjective data for the next round of concrescence. And each time there's an iterative mm -hmm. and cumulative learning process, which occurs. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes all the way down, right? And so that means that no two moments are ever the same. It might be that there's nothing major learned uh, when a, you know, a burst of electromagnetic radiation from some distant star, you know, travels through empty space. But there's very little in the way of, um, novelty produced, it pretty much continues to vibrate and re reiterate itself indefinitely. Um, but nonetheless, over the, the, the vast spans of cosmic uh, space and time, even simple vibration seems to have possessed enough mental originality to, uh, uh, to instigate these, these emergent mutations so that you got yeah. from hydrogen clouds or a ga uh, uh, clouds of hydrogen gas, you got stars, you got galaxies, and on and on. Um, and so, but I think, yeah, this is a fundamental issue around when we when we, when we we want to metaphysically describe the, the nature of reality, of course, we're going to be using abstractions to do so. But the, I think the risk is when we limit ourselves to just physical explanations, say, explaining the whole universe and this learning process, even in terms of uh, the physics of 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 heat dissipation or thermodynamics. Um, what do we really mean by heat in that way? Because for a physicist, it's a kind of statistical measure and a calculation um, that 
is numerical ultimately. And so we're not, he's not made of numbers. There's, there's, there's a real process going on. Energy is, yeah. is something tangible. It's something uh, that's like active, it's actual. And so how do we describe that in a way that doesn't, doesn't actually leave us in an attempt to be more physical in our explanations that doesn't end up leaving us with a, a pure mathematical abstraction right. at the end of the day. Well, and I want to get there with this because I feel like all of this is bound up with this issue of, yeah, misplaced concreteness, uh, the role of abstraction in learning and all this stuff. And uh, and but and and ultimately to this metaphysical question, which which we're kind of probing at the moment. And so um, there is then this sense if we could you know try to well let's zoom back in on 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 that particular issue of when you when you're talking about metaphysics trying to uh, uh basically being able to be a, a, you know apply everywhere to every entity regardless of scale or complexity um it sounds like you're that's i mean explicitly what you've stated but you've also now said that you're open to the idea of these other categories emerging in time um so in in terms of what the proper role of metaphysics is, like the level of analysis, you could say, where do you come down on that? Do you think that if we're trying to to get to the bottom of this, so to speak, um, that we need metaphysical categories that are going to be just as true of atoms as they are of people? Um, or can we use metaphysical categories that are going to say, oh, no, actually, people have emergent properties that aren't... Um, you know, uh, witnessed here down at the uh, atomic level, and we want to be able to account for that with sort of an evolving metaphysical register of of, of categories. Uh, like, it's, yeah. yeah, so clarify that a bit. So, you know, what undergoes emergent evolution in a kind of Whiteheadian cosmos would be societies. His term would be societies, which is his way of... Um, accounting for the enduring bodies in our everyday and environments as animals our own bodies are societies uh you know rocks and tables and chairs are societies stars are societies their historical roots uh of actual occasions of experience sort of streams of um actual occasions that are repeating certain um definite characteristics uh, sort of as a genetic lineage of sorts and that that maintains a form that persists over time there's no matter underlying the form that is mutely enduring. There's a form that is being reiterated by these little uh, experiencing activities. Um, and much of the non-biological world that has this in, that has enduring forms is very repetitive. And we can use mathematical models to predict it with a very high degree of accuracy. Once you get biological societies, there's more life, as we say, and it's harder to mathematically model these things. Yeah. Um, we could, we could produce more abstract models uh, like free energy principle type things. Um, they give us a general picture of how that might be possible for a cell or an animal to navigate its environment uh, through a kind of predictive processing or whatever. But we're very far from being able to take even a single paramecium, mathematically model it so as to know what it's going to do next in a particular environment. So right. We just have no idea. And so society's become more complex. Yeah. There are emergent events which occur. You go from chemistry and autocatalysis to autopoietic cells that reproduce one another, uh, reproduce themselves to multicellular animals with nervous system. And, and yeah, new capacities are coming online as this process of social evolution uh, in Whitehead's terms occurs. But the fundamentals of what an actual occasion is and what it's capable of and what mm -hmm. allows for these societies to emerge, maintain themselves yeah. and and be conscious and intelligent and agential. That's that's baked in. That's what reality okay. yeah. is. So I yeah. think I agree with that. Cause I mean I'm I'm a monist. You know, I think that that this is all it's all one, so to speak. And then from that one stuff, you get everything that we see, but we're talking about, you know, different configurations of different complexity levels. And then I do think that that creates different kinds of emergent sorts of behavior that then require new, basically, laws to be able to account for. But that doesn't mean that, you know, there's a dualistic or or pluralistic nature to the ontological basis of reality. So in that sense, I think I think we agree on that. And so I'm willing to say that, yes, okay, if we mean that, then I would say that these metaphysical categories should apply everywhere to every entity, regardless of scale and complexity. But now here's the interesting thing. Um... And I think there's two, there's so much, but there's two aspects here. Let's just briefly say one of that, one of them is that 
those metaphysical categories, I think, are rather sparse. They're 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 interesting, but they're you know because they're so general, they're not particularly you know uh, uh, compelling, or you could say in that sense. Uh, so we'll, we'll just leave that aside for a second. Um, but it's worth noting. The other thing, though, which I think is much more important, is that um, is that given that. And we see that complexification does, while still coming out of this monistic ontological substrate, whatever we want to think of that as, lead to new and new kinds of phenomena. Um, that's where I see the action. And I guess that these are two kind of directly related ideas. It's like when we're really interested in trying to chart then complexification, um, it's in seeing what dynamically and creatively emerges and evolves out of that process that I feel like is the real, uh, that's where the, that's, that's the story part. Um, so when I, and here's the key point I want to make, um, for me, thermodynamics is, I guess, let's say, a uh, a way to be able to frame this as sort of like, yes, stuff does occur at this thermodynamic level all the way down. But the whole point to me is that there are discontinuities that even though you can look at anything in thermodynamic terms, at a certain point, that becomes, uh, it doesn't give you a lot of information about what's going on, right? If you try to assess uh, a paramecium in terms of just thermodynamics, you're going to not be able to account for much, right? And the more complex you get, the less and less a purely kind of thermodynamic explanation is going to be able to do any work. And that's directly proportional to the level of complexity, as you were just saying, right? Like the regularity of how like a crystal in space, you know, how can we mathematically model that and how deterministic and how sort of like rudimentary and sort of easy, you know, is that to, to conceptually deal with? versus, you know, paramecium on up to a human being, you're getting layers and layers and layers of informational richness stacking on informational richness that, um, yeah, the whole point is that you can't then reduce that down to some simple explanatory process. And so when I use thermodynamics, to be clear, I'm not trying to then say, look, it's all just thermodynamics, right? But I do think that if you're trying to account for the whole story, that then when you st get the story started, it's going to be rather basic, boring kinds of more deterministic stuff or stochastic stuff that then blossoms eventually into more complex, interesting, sophisticated, and I think ultimately kind of more intentional and uh, and 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 conscious uh, phenomena. Um, but so, you know, like I think in in broad strokes we 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 agree with each other, but. Is the distinction there that I'm trying to draw clear or, or, you know? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, thermodynamics are so tricky and, and understanding entropy, especially when it gets borrowed. I mean, cause you, you, you really do play on this um, translation that can be made and you're careful uh, between it entropy and information which claude shannon first does mm -hmm. but he's kind of using it metaphorically mm -hmm. um and a lot of people co collapse the metaphorical use and um uh, and entropy is a slippery concept because you know you mentioned crystals and uh i hope i can get this right but crystals are actually actually an example of a very ordered state mm -hmm. of matter that's also very high entropy in the sense that there aren't any other states that those molecules could be in in that closed system uh, that, that that they've already fallen into mm. uh, I think the most probable state, right? And yet, is it still a very ordered state? And so we often equate entropy with disorder, but that's not always true. Um, and so it's these are such slippery concepts, which makes them generative. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I mentioned this in my in my post, but I think it's a very neat sort of historical fact that. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington is giving the Gifford lectures in 1927, and that's where he famously says, um, "Entropy is, in some sense, the supreme law of the physical world." And like, you can contradict Maxwell, you can contradict uh, Newton, even, uh, but uh, God forbid you contradict entropy, and your theory is, has got to be wrong. Uh, Whitehead comes along a year later, giving the Gifford lectures and at the University of Edinburgh, and says basically yeah there is obviously this tendency in the universe for things to waste away but there's a counter agency there's another tendency it's just as just as real but the thing is we can't account for it by something we could physically measure um 
and even entropy is already a statistical measure. It's not, um, you know, we're not actually tracking energy at that level of precision. You, you can't track every molecule in a gas chamber. You're giving a statistical measure that tells you, you know, not where any individual molecule will be, but as in total, where uh, the system will be after a certain amount of time, probabilistically speaking. Um, but Whitehead's saying there's a, there's a mental pull to reality. You're never going to be able to measure that with any instrument because it's the mental pull always seems to be kind of behind the scenes. It's like, um, on the one hand, it's the one who d designed that instrument in the first place. That's where the mental pull comes into the picture and the theory of of thermodynamics. Um, but it's it's Whitehead says that the mental pull is is responsible for the diversion of energy. And so, you know, he didn't have the word constraint yet, mm. but there's there's some sense in which that that's what he's talking about. And you know, with the laws of thermodynamics, uh, there are certain assumptions built in there that I think still need an explanation in order for thermodynamics to really count as an explanation. And that's it, well, the source of constraints. Like, where did those first come from? What allows energy, even if it's entropically governed and there's a tendency to dissipate gradients, let's say, where did the gradient, where did the first gradient come from? Where did the first constraint come from that allowed work to be accomplished by the movement of heat? Well, that's not explained by entropy itself. Right. You know? Well, that's what makes it a first principles account, too. I mean, and that's ultimately, I do think what we're all aiming at. I mean, first principles and values is similarly what the, you know, uh, what the cosmo erotic humanism people are trying to do is trying to account for meaning and value from first principles. And again, as I note in, in a, at least a footnote in the book, I don't think that that's quite the right approach either. But we are trying yeah, to get to the, the bottom of it, so to speak, right? And so um, the reason why Eddington says that in that lecture and, and why physicists have largely followed suit, well, not just largely, but I mean, I don't know of a physicist who kind of would contest that, is because it does seem to be a, the nature of 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 reality uh, that it follows that second law of thermodynamics. And if we could account for it in a more primitive way, it, then that would be the deeper law, right? But uh, in a sense that, that that's just, that's how it works. So there, there is an element to that. We do have to start from er any account of anything from some place where it seems like, all right, now whether or not the, the second law is itself emergent, you know, that is a different kind of conversation and in some ways it well it's not that i'm saying it's emergent it's it's really let me put a fine point on this because i i think it's it's crucial that i'm mm -hmm. saying entropy is not actually self-justifying in the sense right. that it's presupposing an earlier first principle which would be where's the source of constraint coming from um you know another way of saying it is uh entropy a measure of entropy is always going to be perspectival or situated somewhere looking in a certain direction and and from that situation it seems like uh this would be the more disordered state relative to that state um but in you know a big bang cosmology in order for dissipation to give rise to higher forms of organization that increase the global entropy there must have been a very low entropy state at the beginning and and that's um that requires an explanation that's not already sort of coming along for free with just the declaration that heat dissipates right right though it dissipates I, from where how did it get uh concentrated originally well i mean part of this it becomes an infinite regression issue right where it's sort of like once you get to some seemingly i mean we have what are called anthropic constants or just constants in general right like why do why does what it, why is the speed of light the way it is right it, it is it just is i mean like presumably there's some root cause for that maybe or maybe not May, i mean when you're trying to do fundamental physics it's fundamental in some sense of like we've tracked it down to as far as it can go and and that's what we're working with um and so i think if you're going to try to regress that causal chain further back um i mean in our current model right that does actually reach a point at the at the singularity where it's like no 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 it doesn't make sense to ask the question what happened before the big bang or where did the big bang come from you know to certain kind of scientific framing of that question cuz it came out of this process but you are asking something i think that is true which is that there are constraints that create that are necessary for a physical universe to occur but once we start asking those questions they do enter us into a realm of speculation that we're not necessarily naturalistically. I think it's just the difference between physics and metaphysics. I mean, if we're going to do metaphysics, these are the questions, right? Mm. We can't just rest satisfied with a description of entropy. 
obviously, yes, that's happening. But metaphysics is then saying, oh, okay, what must be the case if that's possible? But say, right? That's just how I understand yeah. metaphysics. So for uh, maybe it's important then to appreciate the kind Definitely of- Definitely speculative, yes. Right. <laughs> Let's see, like the kind of project that I'm engaged in is specifically trying to bracket like what what do we what do we seem to know with a good amount of certainty uh without having to lean too much into speculation metaphysical speculation uh and and can we account for meaning and value on those terms that's basically what i'm up to if people want to then say well but where did the big bang come from and you know what is the nature of of reality and truth and what you know what does it mean for uh, you know, logical consistency to be necessary. Like these are questions are good ones, but like, you know, those are in the realm of a kind of metaphysical thought that I'm trying to leave this important question of meaning and value out of, because if we want to hang our hat on metaphysical speculation, we've kind of seen what happens when we try to do that too much, right? If it's sort of like, oh, all right, well, we can all take this back to the bank of the first mover, right? In some kind of Aristotelian sense, it's like, oh, I don't know about that. Or, you know, obviously, and you mentioned earlier the the move away from kind of scriptural uh, and mythic accounts of reality into into different accounts, like if we're trying to use speculation in a kind of domain of just sort of abstract thinking of what might or could be the case, um, I think then we're going to be in danger of our sense of meaning and purpose becoming profoundly destabilized whenever that speculation winds up reaching, I don't know, either empirical evidence that invalidates a particular model or thought, or, you know, someone comes along who devises a particular uh, theorem or idea that actually shows why that is internally inconsistent or whatever, right? So, that's why the naturalistic framing I think is so powerful is that it's sort of bracketing that stuff off and it's just working with what we seem to know from the world of physics and science. Uh, can we account for these things? And I think powerfully we can. Um, and I think that that's crucial for people being able to then find a sense of meaning and purpose that they don't have to then, you know, feel like that's all resting on potential quicksand. Um, so maybe in that sense, we're engaged in very different projects. And I don't think that metaphysical speculation isn't, you know, important. It's just of a different kind of, it's a different, it's itself a different category from what I'm up to. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, this is really good. I think it does clarify some things because it seems to me that, you know, to go back to this modern break, uh, with the traditional modes of understanding and, and relating to the universe, um, there was a certain myth that got covertly smuggled into uh, modernity and modern science, which is the idea that metaphysics is optional. <laughs> the idea that we could just do empirical observation and test models and not have any kind of metaphysical speculative substratum. Um, I don't think that's possible. I don't think metaphysics is optional. And I think one of the reasons that modernity kind of continued to eat itself uh, and undermine its own real, the value claims it was trying to justify is because of this denial, because of this imagination uh, that it might uh, continue to exist without a mythic, uh, without myth, because you just end up smuggling in covert myths. Mm -hmm. um, and without metaphysics, um, we all have a metaphysics, whether we've explicitly articulated it or not. Because again, metaphysics, it doesn't need to be conceived of as something extra in addition to physics. It's it's a generalization from our physical knowledge, from our biological knowledge, from our psychological knowledge. Mm -hmm. We're generalizing from the special sciences to understand uh, how they are possible. What are What's the deeper conceptual network that would allow us to understand to the extent that we can understand first of all how physics biology psychology etc fit together and also that would allow us to answer the question like okay well what much what must reality what must the universe be like such that it manifests in these special ways well yeah right? no and i i do agree with that and i'm not saying that uh we can eschew uh metaphysical contextualization for our understanding of reality. Um, I don't mean that, but I do mean there's a lot that we can do. For example, when we encounter, let's say a tree, um, that there's a lot of complexity about that tree that we don't have to account for, to be able to, uh, 
kind of meaningfully get by in the world and uh, and have things work and have it 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 be more or less in to be in comportment with reality relative to that tree. Okay, um, so I'm by the tree, another person's by the tree. Maybe I think you know. Uh, let's say one person thinks that you know a god put this tree here, um, and I, I think that it's a product of you know evolution, and another person thinks that uh, you know etc. Right? We could come up with different sort of speculations about what's the context for this moment, but we can all also get by very well together making a house out of that tree. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, or, uh, or, or climbing the tree or admiring the beauty of the tree. I don't mean to put this purely in utilitarian terms, right? Like there are certain things that just present themselves to our experience that then in that sense, metaphysical speculation is a little bit of a surplus or an addendum to, because um, here is this reality that we're engaging with, we're engaging with effectively. And to that degree that we're doing that, we're learning accurately about that tree. So that's kind of the, the the way that I'm talking about things, right? Like I think that we can say study chemistry and uh and chart biological evolution and so on and so forth, uh, in terms of the kinds of work that gets done in the sciences without having to then account for where did the universe come from? <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Like that's the kind of speculation that I feel like we can bracket because it's not immediately bearing on all the things that can come out of what we can do in a meaningful way with the information that we have. What, what do you think of that? Um, I agree. I think just uh, maybe, and I think this is true of you too, well, but you're, you're maybe being humbler or just uh, not, not fully wanting to acknowledge your own curiosity about these big questions in this particular moment. Uh, to defend a, a, a more you know moderate position in terms of what we can actually make sense of with the learning from the, the latest special sciences. Um, but look, you know, Aristotle said we're we're the thinking animal. We're we're the 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 sorts of beings that um, wonder. And uh, even Kant said, look, I don't. Kant didn't think we could answer the questions, but he said we're going to keep asking them. Mm -hmm. It's in our nature to ask them. Uh, and so. You know, we're this is what we're here to do. We're to, we're here well, to understand certainly. the nature of the universe. No, Let's I, do it right now. I think that's certainly true. <laughs> and obviously, I'm curious about where the universe came from. But again, this project that I'm engaged in, I conceive of as trying to do a couple things, which is one of which is that people in our society that you and I are a part of, and however we want to, de to delimit that, um, we, I think, both acknowledge that there is a deficit of and a kind of profound collective confusion around issues of meaning and value, which is having profound negative consequences on the ecosystems, the, the biosphere, and ultimately our own survivability and thrivability and sustainability as, as a species and all the other species around us. So like direct consequence of breakdowns in meaning, value nihilism, relativism, et cetera. And so I see that as a direct consequence of people drawing false conclusions. And I, I because I experienced this myself of working with certain premises about reality that lead to false conclusions about the nature of meaning and value. I myself went through a period of like, oh, I guess we're all just de deterministic, reductionistic particles moving through space and therefore meaning and value are just an invention for social control and all this stuff, right? And it's like, no, that's actually not true. <laughs> and it's not true, not because we have to speculate about where the universe came from. It's not true just based on what we know about s subsequent developments in the sciences and gen better understandings about um, complexification and information and so on and so forth. So what I'm, what I see the goal is trying to um, maybe, yes, more humbly in some sense, delimit the project towards, all right, given more or less consensus understanding uh, from the natural sciences and natural philosophy and let's just say the sciences in general, um, though, of course, this also includes uh, uh, the humanities uh, to, uh, to some degree. Um, uh, given that, can we have a more accurate uh, accounting of meaning and value. Uh, it, it, just using that framework, can we understand what we mean by meaning and value in a way that actually has some real legs to it that we can be like, hey, actually, yeah, things aren't all meaningless. Like it's actually very clear that m meaning and, and, and value are are real in some profound sense, and then go from there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we can do that without having to postulate 
speculative metaphysical entities that your average scientist would have trouble assenting to. And so that's why framings of meaning and value that want to, for example, posit it as being sourced beyond and above or beyond and beneath space and time are like, no, 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 I don't think we have to do that. And it's just sort of like a scope issue, right? It's like, um, you know, I've Carl Sagan famously quipped, right, to, uh, you know, to bake a loaf of bread, first you must invent the universe. But like, okay, yeah, but actually to bake a loaf of bread, you need the ingredients and you need to put it in an oven and all that stuff. And so rather than someone being like, hey, I can't bake this loaf of bread until I know where the universe came from. It's like, well, I don't think we actually need to do that. So yes, I'll totally admit my own fascination of, of curiosity around these metaphysical issues. But I also think that they're going to remain speculative for a long time to come. And if we want to hang our hat on this sort of receding horizon of continual metaphysical questioning as being the base of our meaning and value, I think then then we're going to be waiting a long time, you know? And I, I just think that that level of uh, metaphysical establishment isn't necessary to do the sorts of work that I think we can already do. Last thing I'll say about that is that I, I'm open to the idea of this framing that I've given in this book being given more fundamental accounts, right? Maybe in 20, 30, 100, 1,000 years, I don't know how long, hopefully we're still around, people say, hey, that whole second law thing, it actually turns out that's all dot, 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 dot. And whether that's that's emergent, it's actually there's a more primitive aspect of understanding here. Or now we know that the universe itself was the product of an infinite number of universes in the past or whatever it is, like we can get deeper into that. And I, I not am only open to that. I celebrate the fact that our knowledge is continuing to be evolved and expanded and moved into in terms of our learning because it's a learning process. So um, that anyway, yeah, I'll just that that's some more framing for this project. I, I think of metaphysics as uh, a kind of ontological diplomacy. So we have uh, this tree you're talking about, and we have different interpretations of it. Um, maybe some of them are just flat out wrong. Uh, maybe some of them are ethic ethically questionable. Um, and so the metaphysician is in a situation of having to adjudicate these claims on reality. And, you know, sometimes I have even referred to my approach as a kind of ontological pluralism for this reason, which is more a gesture towards the um, the diplomatic aspect of it. I, I, I'm also a monist in another sense, like I, to say that everything is made of actual occasions is a, is a kind of, you know, monistic uh, uh, suggestion, even though each actual occasion is novel and, and in a sense, a new world arises with each mm -hmm. one. That's also kind of pluralistic. So there's a paradox here. I mean, Deleuze and Guattari say something like that secret formula we're all looking for is the way in which monism equals pluralism and mm. that these don't need to be opposed principles. Mm -hmm. There's a, a synthesis position here. Um, but, you know, so metaphysics is, is has got to be diplomatic. We want to be as inclusive as possible to see. And this is something, you know, Wilbur says in his different ways, like everybody's right. And we just got to figure out how they're right when we see what perspective they're proposition is true from mm -hmm. um metaphysics is the search for those propositions which would be uh as a perspectival as we could get them which is to say they're true from any perspective mm. uh which means that when you actually try to utter a metaphysical proposition it can seem almost utterly meaningless because it's so general it's so vague it's meant to apply to everything and so as you were saying earlier it could be kind of boring to actually do metaphysics uh in this way um but What's unique about the approach I would want to take, really rooting it in experience, is that it's, you know, in William James's sense, it's radically empirical. It's different from Humean empiricism. James thinks we, we, we also feel relations directly, not just our experience as is in as Hume thought, just uh, composed of these like raw sensory universals or quality or something that the mind then associates and builds up an inner model of the world. Radical empiricism says no, we feel the world directly. And Whitehead's elaborating on this Jamesian kind of phenomenology or, or radical empiricism so that his metaphysics, his account of concrescence, I, I I hope can be understood not not as a kind of series of posits that he's just coming up with categories and like that they're internally consistent. It's like, well, what does this have to do with the actual world we, we inhabit together? Mm -hmm. What he's trying to do is look at our human experience. Uh, and he's a deep you know, student of James's principles of psychology, this amazing text from 1890 that in many ways, even in the in neurology is like 
ahead of us 100 years plus 130 mm -hmm. 40 years plus later we haven't made much in advance on james i would say uh i don't uh, people should read principles of psychology and let me know if they think that's true um but whitehead wants an account of reality that does justice to our human experience of conscious agency uh as well as to our uh understanding of quantum physics as well as to understanding of physiology and how cells uh, navigate their environments. He wants one set of categories that applies across all of them and does justice to all of them without having to say that any of these levels is more real than any other level. And like, you know, he's very clear that none of the laws of physics and chemistry are broken in the way that the human body operates. But that's not the same thing as saying that there aren't other principles at play. And I know you're full, fully aware of this with, you know, the ideas of emergence. Um, but rather than thinking of his radically empirical metaphysics as just uh, positing metaphysical entities left and right, he's really trying to look at what are the hardcore common sense presuppositions of human existence that, that are required for science to be possible and all of our theorizing about nature to be possible and also for our uh, our sense of ourselves as moral agents, for law to be possible, for you know politics. Um, we need all those things to be real and i know you think they're real um and even if they are in the intensity and complexity which they they uh realize even if they might be emergent there's also something that whitehead thinks must be true of reality as such if conscious agents could have emerged at some point later on and that looks something like saying that yeah aim or value is now normally we would want to say intrinsic and the thing is that's not we don't want to say intrinsic if that means non-relational mm -hmm. <laughs> value is totally relational aim is totally relational um and so rather than say that value is intrinsic we could say that i mean we may as well just say that relationality is intrinsic relationality goes all the way down and that to be in relationship is it's an erotic, it's erotic, it's an erotic activity. And that that eros is, you know, and here I'm shifting into some of that Zach Stein's language and um, cosmoerotic humanism because I like it. Um, I'm not familiar with all the details and I don't know exactly how it diverges, but this idea that, you know, space and time ultimately are ways that we have of measuring the world and which geometry we use to try to measure space and time or space time. I think I'm with. Pancare and, and Whitehead that that's kind of a, it's it's a matter of a convention there's no I, I disagree and Whitehead disagrees with Einstein I know that's bold but just to think that there's only one space-time metric for the way that the physical world is it I think that's actually an instrumental choice it's like it depends uh you know what different geometries are useful for different purposes um and so it seems to me that when we when we generalize when we seek to come up with metaphysical explanations um what we're trying to do is uh arrive at a set of categories that would allow us to uh to take our own conscious agency seriously just as much as we take the findings of natural science seriously um and at the end of the day to make experience the arbiter because if our conscious agency, if we if if we end up wanting science to explain our conscious agency by reference to something that has fundamentally no experiential aspect, fundamentally no aim, um, we're always, from a Whiteheadian point of view, going to be committing the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. We're going to be putting the model before experience and attempting to come, somehow get experience out of the model. Yeah, and that whole cluster of ideas that you just you know mapped all. For me get down to this issue and i don't know how to get to the bottom of it but it it does seem to turn on this problem of continuity and discontinuity um i mean i think one of the biggest aspects where and i was trying to get at this earlier but didn't do a very good job framing it is that i think where we diverge at most is that um you know what language do i even use for this something like you know that experiential aspect that you want to find that continuity with going all the way down, I am very comfortable as seeing as discontinuous, right? As being something that that emerges, yes, out of earlier 
real realities, but doesn't necessarily need to go as far down as a, a panpsychic perspective once it or is positing it goes. And for that, right, like I have I have no issue seeing, for example, will emerging out of um what lower down the stack is more or less deterministic or chaotic. Um uh, that to me is not a problem in the same way that, you know, when I look at um, certain phenomena ar around me that I recognize wouldn't make sense to posit at a fundamental level, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know what the example would be, color, uh, you know, like, yeah, color is real, right? It's it's there, I see it, and, and, and it's all around me. But at the same time, you know, once you, then you appreciate that there's this, like, photon relationship and the you know and and how light gets diffracted and the angle and all this stuff you're like oh okay then yeah i guess at a certain point maybe there isn't really color in how i think about it and actually maybe color is a more contextualized notion of some deeper reality and those kinds of discontinuities are fine for me and in fact they enhance the whole story it's like color emerges out of a colorlessness or water or wetness or word emerges out of you know things that aren't wet and um you know emergent behavior of various kinds reflects certain Certain kinds of uh, degrees of pattern and and certain phenomena that just aren't present in the in the earlier parts, and it's like that to me is is fine. So then I don't need to have in my conception of things atoms having some willful nature to them. Um, you know, I, I like also myself language around love and eros, but. M really as a metaphor until you get to something that has a, a nervous system, right? That, that can like feel that. And so again, I, I, I get the hang up, but I, 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 I haven't yet found a way of being able to cognize, you know, what the problem is as we move further into the, let's say less complexity as these things shading further and further down until you're really just dealing with something that is, you know, probabilistic or chaotic or deterministic. And it's like that to me doesn't uh, diminish anything and it doesn't provide, it doesn't cause any kind of philosophical confusion or, you know, sense of contradiction of like, well, how did we then come to be from these things that weren't that? It's like, well, that happens all the time everywhere, how, you know, all over the universe, things are becoming things that they weren't. Um, and yet, they do follow a dependent relationship on what has been. So there's continuity and discontinuity. And all of these issues seem to get hung up on that point, which is why I'm kind of belaboring it, um, because it's 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 related to the panpsychic bit. It's related to the role of models and abstraction. Um, and so for me, and I'm not sure if this is a temperament thing or if I'm missing something philosophical, if there's an argument that could be made that like would you know show why there's some contradiction here, you know, I don't know. Anyway, so that's that's where I'm coming at it of like uh, uh, as an issue around continuity, discontinuity. And I guess the last thing I'll say is that for me, then the whole story is itself one of beginning from simplicity and then getting love and feeling and emotion and wonder and awe and splendor and all these things. Right. And it's precisely because it doesn't begin there and becomes that that we get this really profound evolutionary narrative that is towards greater meaning and value and depth and consciousness. Um, whereas if we tried to, to somehow put some minuscule version of that and stuff it in the way, all the way down right at the beginning, sort of like, anyway, do you see what I mean? So the, all these things are bound up with, with each other and that's why it, it becomes so difficult. And it's like, we're trying to un unpack each other's gestalts on this whole thing. And so it's hard. Yeah. I mean, would you, are you comfortable with, the um, category of kind of emergent physicalism as what a metamodern cosmology, your your metamodern cosmology is proposing. It's a, it's basically emergentist physicalism. I would need to know what you meant by physicalism, obviously, because I think that term easily gets elided either with materialism or and or naturalism. And I make a distinction between all these. I'm very happy with naturalism. Um, I just and, mean whatever the best science of your choice of the current day with it's not uh looking at anything that can't be measured and modeled mathematically like and so in other words energy uh, thermodynamics information theories that that that's what's considered physicalism nowadays um well and i do think you're saying consciousness many, is emergent from yeah i mean yeah, there are many things that, like consciousness we obviously don't know how to measure and model um and so i i, I think that 
uh, but it's clearly real. Um, you know, and again, you talked about constraints earlier. Um, there, there's so many other forms of causation that aren't just, you know, efficient causation, um, which, yeah, uh, there was one point in your response, which might have been yeah. construed as me suggesting that I, I basically just think that there's only efficient causation, which is not the case. I think that there are all these other forms that, that go into What that. about when the universe was just clouds of hydrogen? Would yeah, you say so, that is just efficient causation? Or? Um, no, not really in this. So there's a great book, Context Changes Everything by Alicia Her Her Herraro. Um, she talks mm -hmm. a lot about these constraints that are themselves causative, you know, that they have a causal force in reality. But like, and she uses so many examples of this um, too quickly, right? Like if you put a couple people over a bridge, uh, the bridge is fine. If you put um, a whole group of people going over a bridge, the bridge is fine. If you put a whole group of people going over a bridge who are all stepping in unison, you're going to create certain frequency dynamics that actually could cause the whole bridge to collapse. Um, that's not an efficient causation thing, right? It's the same number of people. It's the same number of particles. What's different is that there's a different constraint on how, like the, the, the differences, pattern. the pattern, the, the differences yeah. are different. Um, and, you know, a... a, a a rotary if you go around you know one of these um uh, traffic circles right like it causes material to behave differently even though there's not like some thing crashing into another thing so there's all sorts of different ways and those are all real right so i want to be very open to the causal forces but i do think this part is really important there are causal forces and and i i this is the biggest reason why i have my whole hang up around this stuff is because I see at least the project that I'm trying to articulate as being um, causally closed as best as we understand it. And you could disagree with that. And, and, and there are certainly areas of it that probably maybe aren't, right? And when we're talking about the first principles aspect, right? Is it actually causally, causally closed to talk about the second law of thermodynamics as being a first principle? It seems to be, but maybe that could be pushed back if we had different you know, information and, and or theory, what have you. But my point is that um, there is a general sense that things cause other things. And my biggest concern around any alternative theory comes in when you want a kind of free lunch and you want to say, ah, but there's this other thing that doesn't have a causal you know, explanation that we can account for. And then at that point, I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like, And I think a little bit this mental pull of, of the Whiteheadian framing and sourcing things beyond space and time is, is another version of this. And similarly, right. It's like, I just, that to me is a sign of like, you know, we've hung our hat on metaphysical speculation rather than a, a, a pretty clear accounting of what occurs. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for a model that can be as best as we can causally closed, because as soon as you introduce a lack of causal closure, it's not scientific and it's not really an account. Let me, of, let me ask you about that causal yeah. closure, because that would seem to me to be if if causal closure holds, how can that be squared with the possibility of a kind of emergent top down agency from, say, a conscious human being? Um, if causal closure holds, I'm pretty sure we have to go with Robert Sapolsky and say we're completely determined. Yeah, and I, I and I, I think that this is where a lot of this boils down, because I don't I don't agree. I think that you can still have causal closure and emergence and unpredictability um, and all of that. I, I don't think that this leads us to radical determinism. And I think one of the whole insights of emergence is that th th these are causally closed phenomena that are still un fundamentally unpredictable. Uh, so for example, right, in, in certain emergent phenomena or modeling, right, the only way to know what happens is to run the simulation. There's no way of predicting it. There's no, like theoretically, mathematically, it's unpredictable. The only way to know what happens is, okay, let's see. Um, and so that is therefore, but it's not magic. It, it is real and it's mathematical and it can be accounted for, but you just, it's, it's, it's fundamentally impossible to know in advance. That's the kind of stuff that I feel like we need to be orienting to, to get the kind of more mysterious phenomena that we experience. I mean, Stuart Kaufman's notion of the adjacent possible and all this stuff Stuart Kaufman is a scientist. He wouldn't say, well, yeah, there's actually no causal, you know, it, it, there's no, you know, he's, he's not going to be positing magic. It, it's just that when you look at how these things play out, they are open and that they're fundamentally open. And so that gets us out of the straitjacket of reductionism. Uh, and, and, and that to me is so important. I guess I don't see 
causal closure i don't see the i don't see these things being consistent i don't think we need to have causal closure in this because causal closure to me implies that um all we would need to know is the position and the velocity of uh the 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 particles or the uh the 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 way that the fields are behaving at any given moment and then there's no way for anything to intervene and how that's going to play out and there are entailment laws that'll tell you exactly what's coming next maybe the modeling thing yeah that's true but that's is that in principle or is that in principle we, we couldn't have perfect knowledge of everything yeah of the initial conditions well this does get to some interesting questioning around issues of emergence is it epistemological or is it ontological this sort of a mm -hmm. thing but i do think i'm actually glad that we're hitting on this because this to me is super important and i think a lot of people will both under misunderstand what i'm trying to do um if 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 this isn't unpacked and i think that will also continue to fall into pre-modern traps unless we can square this issue. Because I think that this is what leads people to want to abandon rational causal explanations of things because they feel like if I go in that direction, I'm going to get stuck in the straitjacket of reductionism. And it's like, I no, I don't think that's the case. So well, just to say rational causal explanation that we would, I, I'm with Aristotle, we could have at least four different ways of understanding sure. what a cause is. Yep. And so just because we're saying causal closure to me is about efficient causes being sufficient. And I'm saying if we really wanted a rational causal explanation, we're going to need to go beyond that, even at the level of hydrogen atoms, uh, a, a it, cloud of hydrogen. I atoms. don't think about it that way. And I'm happy to be corrected if I'm misusing that phrase. Maybe in the history of philosophy, causal closure only refers to efficient causation, but I mean all forms of causation. I mean, final cause. I mean, formal cause. I mean, oh, you know. Well then, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 okay. Well, so this is good. Okay. So, so for me, what I want to avoid is this uh, <laughs> this example of what you could call the one-ended stick, right? So I, I used to live with this aesthetic philosopher, and he was just an ardent atheist and materialist, more or less. Um, so I don't agree with his whole metaphysical uh, suppositions, but he 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 kept harping on this thing that I do think is a good illustration of at least this one point, which is he would always say God is a one-ended stick. Um, and by which he meant we can imagine a one-ended stick, uh, but if you actually were to think about like or or try to make a one-ended stick, let's say like that doesn't that's not possible, right? So so we have certain ideas in our heads that we think make sense, um, but then they don't actually exist. And so this also has a profound connection to the whole learning uh framework that we're conceiving of because children might say that oh yeah when i roll out the ball of clay now there's more ball of, of clay than there was before when it was a ball right because look it's longer but actually it's because there's a deficiency in what they're able to bring together simultaneously and integrate in terms of the different causal aspects that are going on here also this is why the developmental tradition is so key and clutch for this whole line of argumentation because it's the developmental approach that is what allows us to see more and more causal variables integrated into a, a relationship with one another. And that leads us into complex thought from simplistic thought. So anyway, my whole point is that we want to avoid concepts that are one-ended sticks where we actually need to be able to account for what's going on here. And that doesn't mean, oh, look, we have you know this velocity and, and, and position and therefore we know everything. Not that at all, but we need to account for all the different possible forms of causation. And this is where you do get into all of the complex ways uh, that things influence each other. And this is why complexity thinking is so important because it's still causal, right? When you look at a murmuration of birds behaving the way that they do, it's not like, you know, oh, it's magic now because isn't that cool? It's like, no, there's still a reason why this is occurring, but we can begin to appreciate how this whole network of causes is having a kind of uh, you know summative cause. So, that to me is clutch. I'll pause there, but like I, I'm glad we're hitting on this issue because this is um, hmm. really important. Yeah. So I, it has been my working understanding that causal causal closure implies efficient causation is sufficient. Okay. Uh, and and that you know there's an attempt to eliminate the need for any uh, formal or final causes. Uh -huh. um, maybe there's other understandings of what causal closure means and well so we i'll can... defer to you i mean you are the you're the you're much more in the realm of metaphysics and philosophy so if that's how but you the way that... you're defining it i, I okay as long okay. as we're including formal yeah. and final causation as part of what a naturalistic explanation would require right uh 
and I would say at all scales, then yeah. I'm on board with that. Um, but in terms of this one stick thing, yeah, if I could just respond sure. to that, I, I like that. And I think, yeah, the idea of God as a, um, a creator, um, as the prime mover, uh, as um, uh, having, yeah, that, that is an idea that is like impossible to, to understand how it could be real because it, it's like it, everything has two sides. But Whitehead's God is dipolar, right? And actually, I would think of physicalism as a one-sided stick in mm. the sense that where it's an accounting of reality and bringing in emergence, I think, muddies the waters a bit and requires a lot more. I mean, that it requires this whole conversation. But to posit the general physicalist sort of position that, you know, reality is just this collection of physical causes, efficient causes, uh, is to neglect the conditions of the possibility of your knowledge of that fact. In other words, mm. this physical universe, so-called, gave rise to uh, conscious agents doing science who then describe it as a physical, mm -hmm. uh, causally closed system of interactions. You're, you're, you're not accounting for your own existence. You're trying to describe the universe as though it yeah. were one-ended stick and forgetting that you're standing on the other side of that stick yeah. making this explanation. Yeah. Um, and so we always need to be dipolar this is why dipolar metaphysics is so important. We want both ends of that stick uh, and well, never to forget in our explanations that there's yeah. an explainer and we need to account for the explainer just as much as the Definitely. terms of the explanation. And I totally agree with that. But here's the question for you is that would you be comfortable with a notion of consciousness being causally closed in the sense that I'm talking about all formal, final, not just efficient cause, but that there it, at, at the end of the day, so to speak, um, consciousness uh was it could be accounted for in the sense that you know real cause and effect mechanisms were and i know the me the word mechanism might be problematic here but i mean relationships let's say cause and effect relationships um mm -hmm. are the means by which we experience our our conscious realities how does that idea land for you and i'll just qualify that with one thought which is that a lot of people want to make consciousness this sort of black box, you know, of sort of intentionally it it doesn't relate to causal relationality. And and that's where I, I find, you know, this is partly why the scientific enterprise to describe consciousness becomes so uh, kind of uh, difficult from the beginning because some people just want to keep it inherently immune from any kind of causal. Um, and I don't want to say explanation because I think that that sounds reductive, right? But in the same way that like, you know, uh, Let's say, well, I'll, I'll pause there because, I, yeah. So do, does that notion that consciousness um, is a product of a very complex set of causal relationships, how does that idea land for you? Uh, that's fine with me. Um, you know, consciousness, what it says is derivative. Uh, hmm. It's not, it's not the, it's, it presupposes experience for him. And so experience is most experience is not conscious. And a lot of people have trouble with that whole yeah. concept, like what conscious is an experience. They're just synonyms. Like, um, but he actually wants to reserve what we think of as consciousness, whether animals or self-consciousness in human beings as, yeah, uh, an emergent phenomenon that is the, the result of the, the filtering and the amplification that these social, yeah forms of, of enduring, you know, biological bodies uh, afford us. Um, and so he'll say, you know, there are certain streams of occasions of experience flitting around in the interstices of the brain, he says, uh, that are peculiarly situated so as to inherit uh, through tra transmission, channels of transmissions of feelings through the body, uh, a, a highly filtered, like organized um, uh, flow of environmental vectors right mm -hmm. and and these occasions of experience that we associate with our conscious stream of thought our self-consciousness uh are you know uh, summing up or or a kind of accumulation of all of this environmental st and it, you know this is very similar to you know contemporary accounts um uh uh in terms of um you know embodied and active accounts and also you know there's a way I, i've been really trying to bring this into dialogue with free energy principle ideas and so there's a lot of, at least on the face of it, convergence in how White thinks of consciousness. Um, and it's, you know, like Levin would say, built atop of this agential material 
um, and is a is an achievement of a collective of cells, which each cell is at the achievement of a collective of uh, mm-hmm. uh, organelles, and 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 on and on. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about nested societies, right? And that there are basal forms of experience upon which our own conscious agency rests. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we can be conscious agents is a testament to the um, the cooperativity of uh, this this community uh, uh, of beings that is able to, uh, in a way, sacrifice their own individual agency for the sake of something larger than themselves that they might not even be capable of knowing anything about. Mm-hmm. And so, th- and you know, just just to to dwell on this point in in the information. So in, in in the semantic informational terms in which uh, you were, um, you know, the researcher drawing on to define living beings um, as being able to produce meaningful information, where meaningful information is whatever they can garner from their environment that allows them to persist, uh, uh, that makes them more likely to persist in that in that environment. It 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 starts to make me wonder if that might not that idea might not have in some way contradict what Levin and others suggest about uh, cellular collectives and the way that an individual cell can actually sacrifice its own uh, need for independent uh, subsistence for the sake of some greater whole, Mm -hmm. uh, some greater collective that it belongs to. And so that leveling switch is an interesting factor that um, I'm not sure how to account for in terms of this, this sense of semantic information requiring or or being identified with information that allows that individual being to persist you yeah know? yeah where's is where's the possibility of sacrifice for the sake of the greater whole yeah in that no account? definitely so. well i'm trying to think of which thing to tackle first because yeah sorry something you were, no, that no, no 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 it's great <laughs> let's come back to that because i have a, a very okay. specific easy answer to that one but okay what you were saying a minute ago um was interesting because it it made me think what you're uh, it, it brought a connection to what you were saying earlier about whitehead's notion of this sort of the whole and and how there's like a the whole is in in all the parts there was a kind of fractal nature you were describing earlier and it was made me think how um yes a body can be in service to the collectivity of a of, of an animal and not have any itself kind of knowledge of that entity but that is the whole context that is permitting that cell to exist and it made me think for a second uh if you wanted to take that notion really seriously that you know the whole of existence in some ways could be partly you could say dependent on our own experience our own reality our own existing and we don't we don't conceive of that in the same way that the cell doesn't conceive of the animal but it is intrinsic it is necessary to the being of that animal in its in its totality and uh that provides a really fascinating way of thinking about our relationship to let's say god i just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on that i have uh, you know imagined uh that the the cells that compose the human body are engaged in some sort of ritual practice whereby they are worshiping we are their version of a kind of monotheistic deity that they are worshiping but it brings home the point that through this practice of of ritual uh uh, uh worship that they're actually also creating that deity like they're not just standing apart from it yeah. like looking up to it they are yeah. making it as they worship it and so yeah. i think that's actually an appropriate analogy for uh human religiosity Ooh, i like that um yeah. I loved reading Durkheim through that lens too, because uh, you know he took a very functionalist kind of reductive stance of like you know God is society. But there's always been this notion, even going all the way back to ancient Greeks, talking about you know if you don't feed the gods, they'll die. And so you know it's really important that, that humans do that. And so there, even there's this kind of nascent notion that human beings create the gods, or that we we are necessary for the gods' survival. Let's say, um, and uh, and then Durkheim kind of comes along and is like, no, like. Yes and no. And it's not because there's a God, but it's because we're all doing this thing. And so we're creating this thing. But I think you can take it really further and much more the way you were just talking about that. We actually, it's all of the, all of the above, so to speak. Um, there's a whole thought that I, I, you know, it would be interesting to unpack in, in other ways, but it, it relates a lot to things that I'm very passionate about in terms of mythopoeia and all of that. But um, I did want to say what you just responded to, though, as beautiful as that is, I do also then again want to drive home, at least for me, that there also needs to be a discontinuity in an account like that, right? Like cells and like there's a, a need to want to draw out the metaphorical because 
there's like, yes, it's analogous to maybe how humans worship a deity is how cells relate ritualistically, as you say, to the body. Um, but I also want to then say, but it's not the same as, and I, I think that pushed, you'd probably agree, but I always want to make that explicit. You know what I mean? Or maybe you don't, maybe, maybe you would say that it is the same. No, I'm sure there are important differences. Um, but I think, you know, in some sense, again, doing metaphysics, we're searching for analogies and no analogy is going to be perfect. Um, but we do want to make these comparisons and yeah, this point about continuity and discontinuity is, is super important. Um, I mean, it's deeply, uh, uh, sort of woven throughout Whitehead's whole accounting of, of, uh, of the universe that, um, he, he explained both those those aspects which are continuous and those which are discontinuous and he ends up there's this kind of enigma, enigmatic uh statement he makes at one point in process in reality that there is a um there is no continuity of becoming there is a becoming of continuity and what what he means by mm. that is that um the actual occasions are what become and they give rise to continuity so continuity mm. is at the level of um you would say possibility is continuous. So the realm of eternal objects, there's there's uh, infinitely many eternal objects for precisely the reason that like you're never gonna, there are infinitely many shades of color between red and orange, you know, uh, infinitely many numbers between one and two, you know, it's, and so um, possibility is continuous, but actuality he says is incurably atomic. Hmm. And by atomic, he doesn't mean a little particle yeah. atomos in greek means right. whole in a sense yeah. undivided quantized um, yeah and so you know continuity becomes which is to say this is one of the reasons he says that space time which again is a kind of abstract metric and i kind of lost my train of thought earlier getting into that really interesting issue space time for whitehead is like a field of possibility that is emergent from the relationships among actual occasions right and so these little processes, these little acts of experience are relating to one another and they're all internally related through these networks of prehensions are giving rise to maintaining and, and always also subtly transforming what we call space-time. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, the space-time studied by physics has been laid down, you know, billions of years ago by what Whitehead would call the electromagnetic society. And even even more basic than that, what he would call the geometric society, which establishes the sort of dimensionality of of the universe as we measure it. Um, that that these are sort of the background forms of enduring uh, order achieved by this network of occasions of experience. But that you know that that continuity of space time can't be absolute. And this is a point yeah. that's not just coming out of his speculative metaphysics, but out of quantum sure. and attempts at quantum gravity. Like, we, we, but it we, also, there seems to be a quantized nature to space time. It also does seem, though, that you get a fine graining as you, you know, look at the statistical whole. And it's like, yeah, maybe in a glass of water, you don't know where any particular p particle is. It's kind of, in that sense, inherently unique and, you know, to kind of make this comparison. But you can get the temperature of the glass of water in its macro state. So you could say space-time is inherently, you know, not absolutizable because it's got all these, you know, linked path-dependent sort of occasions that constitute it. But you could also say, looking out at sort of the swath of what we call space-time, you know, those differences even out and we can do the sorts of things that physicists do because, you know what I mean? It's I don't know if you if one can make that. But they don't comment. even out. There's asymmetry at the, I mean, the cosmic microwave background radiation is right, strangely right. dipolar. It's like, whoa, what's going on? Yeah. Um, um, well, before... Uh, before we close, because which we probably should do soon, um, yeah, I did just want to address that issue around like self sacrifice and that sort of a thing because sure. I think it's important. And one of the things in my framing of this book that I would be worried that people would take away, and so I've made efforts to try to repeat over and over again, not to be confusing here or not to not to you know this is not to say that, and I try to do that multiple times. Uh, because I would be worried that people would take a reductive view of this, uh, right? Anytime you try to do something by developing a kind of archaeology that goes down to the archae, uh, then 
people are going to be tempted to say, oh, that's it's just that. And it's like, no, that's not what it is. It builds on top of itself. And that's what complexification is and why it's so important. So even though I also am making a thermodynamic argument, I'm not just trying to say, look, and now we can use thermodynamics to explain human behavior or whatever. Uh, that doesn't mean that human behavior doesn't have a thermodynamic component to it. So anyway, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that as framing to this specific, particular issue, because by thinking about meaning as pertaining to the information linking an entity with its environment that bears on its viability. Um, it doesn't just presume then that, that we're talking about the atom, the atomistic individual there, right? In the same way, right, uh, that we're, and by, yeah, and I mean atomistic in the way we were just talking about it. I don't, I don't mean atoms, yeah. but like, so, yeah. so I am a human being uh, because there are other human beings. Like I literally cannot be, and I hope this comes through at the, when I talk to the level of symbolic learning and human culture, because my whole sense of being a self is dependent upon there being this shared collective thing that we do called language. And then basically this dynamic feedback loop between my socialization into a collective uh, is, you know, ultimately then what allows me to be an individual ego in a collective society. So the point is, there is no atomistic individual, right? And then this does lead us to the notions of the individual and all of that, this transpersonal thing. But so there is no just like, you know, neoliberal ideal notion of the individual who can be apart from things. It's like, fundamentally, if you're a person, you're part of a collective. Now, if that's the case, then the viability of that individual unit of the collective, its viability is influenced by the collective, right? Without the collective, then the individual couldn't be. And I think the same is true with a cell, right? That if you're talking about a cell in a body that's part of a multicellular organism, um, you know, it, for example, right? Like one cell um, couldn't continue to be if it weren't for the operations of another cell in a totally different part of the body doing a different task. You know, let's say they're part of pumping the blood and the other parts of, you know, filtering the bile or something, right? But like if if these cells stop doing what they're supposed to do, the whole organism is going to die. And so the collective has direct bearing on the viability of the individual constitutive part. And so issues of self-sacrifice seem to me be to be directly accounted for in these sorts of things. And every form of altruism, self-giving, love, all these sorts of things is that like, I am because you are. I am because there are others. And who I am is directly related to you. And my values are directly uh, related to your values. And so to some degree, we are not just individuals. We are also operatives of the collective. And so oftentimes the collective distinctly prizes those individuals who take up that role to, to support the collective um, by sacrificing themselves. So, I mean, you know, evolutionary psychology and other forms of, of, of thought have already, I think, done a decent job tackling this issue because it always gets raised in the context of evolution of like, well, then if we're all just self-serving, you know, entities, why would we dot, dot, dot? And it's like, no, we, we can account for all this very well when we situate ourselves as part of collectives and being dependent on them. Um, yeah. So that would be my answer to that issue. Yeah, I think as long as evolutionary psychologists accept multi-scale selection and group selection of these yeah. things, then I take that particular discipline seriously. There's a lot of evolutionary psychology though that still runs on that 1970s, yeah. 1960s version of Dawkinsian right. selfish gene biology, which ends up reading neoliberal economics into the biological world and justifying current social conditions yeah. uh, by naturalizing them, which I think is highly, that's not a good science. Right. But I think there are other approaches to evolutionary psychology, which, you know, take this, um, the importance of collectivity every individual is made mm -hmm. of individuals and part of bigger individuals and yep. that you know what gets selected is a matter of perspective like all of these scales are operative in evolution in terms of units of selection uh i mean that's and that's a whole other interesting there's yeah. so many little things we could have touched on that we didn't get to today but well we'll we'll have um, another chat because you know uh, at least another because we'll need a couple of these i mean this has been a very wide ranging conversation but again it's it's so I don't think there's anything for that. Like we have to do that because all of these things interact. We're talking, as I said, at the opening, there's so much stuff that you have to unpack to be able to get at the fine shades of difference. These shades of difference do ultimately scale up to have rather different, important, different implications for our kind of bigger ways of seeing all yeah. this stuff. But you've really got to drill down to like find the little nub and then, you know, clarify that. So I'm, I'm very happy to do, um, yeah, uh, another couple of conversations and, and yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel we made a lot of progress um, and that, you know, 
when Whitehead looks at the history of philosophy, he says, don't pay attention to the superficial disagreements. Like look beneath the surface and you see the, the zeitgeist at work. And mm. um, in some sense, metaphysics is is really difficult because it, the real presuppositions, the general presuppositions you're making are always kind of just behind the edge of your conscious yeah. thinking ability. Yeah. And so I, I feel like beneath the surface and to some extent on the surface of everything we've been talking about, there's a lot of um, a, sh a, a shared sense of why this is important, first yeah. of all, um, and uh, an ethical uh, imperative that's that's baked into it, and a a real desire to to learn from each other and to learn from um, all of the you know cutting edge science that's available, mm -hmm. um, and and to just try to you know make sense of our existence in an evolutionary way, uh, you know. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of convergence between us, even yeah. if there are these really interesting. Uh, points where we're trying to figure out um, yeah and i mean i totally agree and it's that being at the edge of your thought because you're trying to give voice to something that is a presupposition to deeper held you know notions um those are precisely the things that you know deserve to be interrogated and so there aren't a lot of folks you know uh for various reasons that um i can have those kinds of conversations with but this one i felt felt i felt there which is a both uh, it's like a it's a very productive and like exciting place to be it's also very uncomfortable because you're like ah oh, i'm usually much more articulate and like i but uh, this is mm -hmm. you know um but it's good because it's supposed to lay bare your suppositions and then you know are they actually justified and that sort of a thing um you know uh, so all of that's all of that's really important plus you know when we lay them bare we can be more clear about you know, sort of like, well, yeah, he's starting from this axiomatic position. And I'm starting here, and they're maybe they're both equally justified, or we have our different reasons for justifying either. But that's why when you you know kind of zoom out, um, the the things are different. Um, but yeah, all that's just to say that um, I think it's it's necessary work, and it might be a bit niche. Maybe this podcast and the future ones that we do won't be for everyone because they are trying to do that sort of a thing. Um, but I do think I don't know. I I, I gain from that. Um, and I do, I think, yeah, I want to do that. I want to dig into what I'm presuming here at, to consider how it could be otherwise. And if it were otherwise, what would that look like? And, um, and how does yeah. that change the whole gestalt? So, um, it might be fun actually, you know, next time to on the surface, totally change the subject and talk about like <laughs> metamodern Christianity and myth huh. and reason and science uh -huh. and how we sort out, cause we might discover connections, to the sorts of details we've been exploring today, yeah. but make it more in a more accessible context. I, sure. I don't know. I'd be up for that. I also, in in our last minute or so here, I wanted to think about, yeah, what would be those next um, moves for the conversation? A couple things came up for me out of this that I think are, are digging into. And one of them is I would love some deeper clarity and maybe it's really boring and technical, but I, there's an issue here of like, um, on the one hand, uh, there is this issue around misplaced concreteness and this abstraction problem that that divorces us from experience. On the other hand, it seems like metaphysics would be a perfect example of that, right? How do we resolve a seeming tension there? I think where you might see me doing that in terms of relying too much on the on the sciences, but I would be concerned to do that by relying on metaphysics. And so, what's sort of the proper role of abstraction? What is abstraction actually doing for us, and how does it work? Those sorts of questions I think would be important to probe. Um, uh, maybe to some yeah. degree uh there are other things too but i'm also very happy to yeah kind of switch gears and then come at it from a totally orthogonal angle and and drill back down into any of this was there were there any particular things that came up for you that you'd want to dig further into well we could talk a bit about some of the issues with a kind of emergentist account of consciousness mm -hmm. um i do think there are certain questions that i would have around um how you know, a kind of epiphenomenal view of what consciousness is differs from the idea of a top-down causal role for consciousness to play and how that does square. Now that I understand that for you, causal closure doesn't mean just efficient causes. Mm. I can see how you can get around that issue. Um, you know, where consciousness comes online in the history of evolution, is it nervous systems? Is it single cells? Uh, is it networks of cells? Because it seems to me that you know the ner the neuron and the nervous system is a somewhat arbitrary boundary i mean a lot of different forms of let's say faster learning uh becomes possible with the nervous systems but single cells paramecium learn have memory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're cognitive agents already mm -hmm. and so is that 
is the nervous system really the line we want to draw there? But so yeah, questions like where love exactly that. on that scale? I we, think that that can... would be a wonderful way to continue this because I do keep when we get into that issue, because you, you mentioned earlier, well, you know, not all experience is conscience. And I'm like, yes, totally. That's sort of the whole point. But then it's like, yeah. so what do we mean? By, and we obviously did a whole conversation on prehension, but it still left me like, so anyway, that would allow us to dig more into that, which I do think is really in many ways, the crux of a lot of this of like, what do we mean by these notions of mentality or intentionality or, or interiority rather, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and all this stuff. So um, yeah, I'd love to dig into that and kind of compare notes of where we and and maybe you can bring some important kind of uh, alternative information to kind of more standard conceptions of what that that looks like. Um, I know you'd mentioned Levin's work and that sort of a thing, and I think he's doing some of that in, in exciting ways. So um, cool. Well, yeah, uh, we'll be in touch and we'll set up another uh, time to to continue this. Um, so uh, I look forward to that, and I appreciate you, man. I this is great stuff. I. Uh, Love having you, as I said, as an interlocutor on all this and um, really, really deep, juicy, awesome stuff. So, uh, Matt Seagal, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, a lot of fun to be in dialogue with you. Till next time.